Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is David Elwood. I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School. It's my very true honor to welcome our speaker here, President Elbig Dorf, back to the Harvard Kennedy School, since he is indeed a distinguished alumnus uh, who graduated from here in 2002 with a master's in public administration. Mr. President, I know that in Mongolia, or at least I'm told that in Mongolia, a gre traditional greeting consists of four questions. Uh, are you well? Is your family well? Are your cattle fat? Is the grass good? <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm also told that the answer is always yes, no matter what the truth is. Um, so I'm glad that this is all good. But we also do know that many, many good things have come as a result of your leadership and your work and your activities, uh, both be before and now as president in Mongolia. Before I begin, I would like to thank some people who made this all possible. Uh, thank the Institute of Politics uh, for all of your work. I'd like to acknowledge uh, several distinguished guests in the audience. Uh, first, former Governor Bill Weld, who is here with us today. Uh, thank you for joining us, Mr. Governor. We have a couple of former heads of state here uh, in the audience. Uh, we have the President of Ecuador, uh, Jamil Mawad. Uh, who's also a classmate uh, in the same class uh, with <laughs> the two of you, as I understood, took Ronnie Heifetz's class together. That must have been a very good year. Uh, so we uh, will do that. Uh, and uh, jo uh, the former prime minister of Greece, pa uh, George Papandreou, I believe, is here. There you are, right there. There you are. <laughs> Are there any other presidents or governors that I've missed? Uh, well, it's uh, no surprise uh, that, that we have such a uh, remarkable group of people to join us, but we have a remarkable leader here in the president of Mongolia. Uh, in the past two decades, remarkable change has come to Mongolia. Uh, and it is very much uh, the changes that have gone from, a, from being an, a, a revolution in political economic and social sectors. Uh, Mongolia has transitioned from a communist regime to a democratic republic. It's gone from a planned economy to a, a burgeoning free market system. And its population has shifted from a predominantly pastoral, from predominantly from pastoral herders to an increasingly urbanized people. <coughs> President Elbigdor's life is actually a remarkable journey that parallels uh, this in many, many ways. It's probably no surprise because he was instrumental in many of the changes that happened. Uh, but he's, uh, it's a really tri stunning transformation personally as well. He was the youngest of eight sons born to traditional nomadic herding family in the mountains of western province of Hovd, uh, bordering on China. At the time of uh, his birth in 1963, Mongolia's economy was based on agriculture and livestock herding and a majority of the population, including his own family, was living in traditional yurts or tents and long, um, along the vast rolling green gas, grasslands of the Mongol steppe. After a short stint in a copper mine, President Elbigdorsh um, began his mandatory military service in 1982. Now here's one part of the story that I find particularly appealing. During this time, the poems he submitted to the army newspaper so impressed his superiors, they awarded him a scholarship to the Military Political Institute in USSR in Lviv, Ukraine, where he earned a degree in military journalism and met his future wife, uh, Belorma. Now look, I understand why Belorma might have liked poems. Um, but I must say, my impression of military service and Mongolian military service, which of course is very famous over the years, would not have necessarily led me to believe that writing poems uh, was an effective way for promotion. So I think very well of the Mongolian military uh, for their wisdom and thoughtfulness, as well as, as your wife. Um, that worked with my wife too, by the way. I thought that was a, it's a good strategy. <laughs> Together, uh, they have five children and they are the foster parents to 20 orphans. Uh, during his study in the Soviet Union, he was greatly influenced by President Gorbachev's call for openness uh, in society and restructuring of the Soviet economic system. He was inspired, too, by President Reagan's passionate promotion of the free market enterprises, economies and democratic values, uh, most especially the freedom of speech. And in 1989, at the age of 26, uh, President Elbdorsh became an early leader of Mongolia's underground democracy movement. 
at very great personal risk, he and other activists helped organize demonstrations and worker strikes that ultimately forced the ruling Politburo to resign in 1980, peacefully ending seven years of communism, 70 years of communism. Later that year, he was elected to the country's first parliament, and subsequently he served in three additional terms um, in parliament. He was involved in the drafting and adoption of Mongolia's post-communist constitution, which introduced human rights, democracy, and an open economic system in the country. He has supported the privatization of livestock, of state-owned assets of land, and for almost half of Mongolia's entire population, uh, the livestock was the first private property they'd ever owned. Uh, as Vice Speaker of the Parliament from 1996 to 1998, he was elected Prime Minister in 1998, uh, although the coalition ultimately fragmented and leading to the dissolution of his government. Uh, while this was a setback momentarily, it was a very good thing for us because he then came to the Kennedy School and spent a year studying here, and again, many of his fellow classmates, as we've noticed, are here today. He returned to politics in 2004, again serving as Prime Minister through 2006, and in 2009, he was elected president. Under his leadership, there have been many democratic reforms and democratic norms of institutions have been strengthened, including freedom of the press, civil rights, uh, judicial reforms, and environmental protection, and uh, various efforts to curb political corruption. Indeed, Mongolia's economy is experiencing really quite spectacular growth, growing at 17% a year, uh, thanks to uh, mostly to foreign direct investment in the mining of, of raw materials and uh, various commodities, such as uh, copper and tin and coal and tungsten. Um, and the president is very much aware also of how to, take, to avoid the so-called curse of commodities and think about ways to invest in the people in the future. One other remarkable success recently was that the country's sporting success in the 2012 Olympics. It's a country of roughly 3 million people, um, and Mongolia team had, Mongolia's Olympic team had 29 members, and they won five medals in many different sports. So the president's leadership has been recognized with a whole variety of awards, ranging from the 2011 UN Environmental Protection named him the champion of the earth for his action. Uh, and last year, the National Endowment for Democracy presented the Demo New York Democracy Forum Medal uh, to the president. So it is my very great pleasure to welcome to the Howard Kennedy School His Excellency, His Excellency Saki Yaknin Elbigdorf. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. You know, it's a really great pleasure and high honor to return to Harvard. You know, I am the one of you. Ten years ago, I, I, I was sitting here as a one of you and listening to the distinguished speakers. And I think uh, from this audience, you are the students and also professors here teaching us, and I think I see many leaders. Usually you will be leaders in your family, in your community, in your organization, in your country. And I would like to put my talk into three places. Just I would like to share what I did after Kennedy School, what I did. You know, in 2002, when I graduated, when I got my diploma, master's in public administration, I felt that I fueled enough. I was like a rocket to launch from here to my country, 7,000 miles away from here. And after Kennedy School, I actually short-term worked at the headquarters of the United Nations. And with my professor, Jeffrey Zacks, together developing the Millennium Development Goal, and which was actually approved by the General Assembly of the UN. And after that, I came back to my country. And, uh, you know, before talking, talking that, you know, I, I really cherish my knowledge and my experience here, Kennedy School. And uh, when I was uh, about to graduate, I thought what, what, I shot, uh, what I should bring to my home. And I thought, you know, that's maybe a good idea, and I, I have to have the Harvard Kennedy School ring. Still, I'm wearing for 10 years proudly my ring. When, 
When I got my ring, I asked my wife, you know, I would like since today's days, I would like to wear this ring. I agree with me. And she said, you know, with ring, without ring, you are the, my lifetime partner. You are the, my husband. Please wear this ring. And I got that permission. You know, <laughs> I also, yesterday afternoon, I, I arrived here and first, I go, I went to the coop. <laughs> you know, 10 years ago, I bought t-shirts for me. Now that's no longer in use. Because of that, I, I thought to go to buy some t-shirts. And I bought some t-shirts for myself and for my children. 25 t-shirts. <laughs> You know, I have 25 children. Because of that, <laughs> I bought 25 t-shirts and for my girls, for my boys. And there was a great uh, scripture saying that future alumni of Harvard, Mr. Dean, I hope you have some people from my admission office. <laughs> some, of them, some of them may apply to study here. You know, what I did after Kennedy School, when I was at the Kennedy School, I, I actually contemplated, I, I think about that. When I go back to Mongolia, what I will do? When, uh, while I'm uh, packing, go to Mongolia, I actually brought every paper, every paper, every bundles, every books, every lecture, I took them to Mongolia, several boxes. And when I was in Mongolia, I opened them and, and, I put, uh, and, and I decided to give lecture to my people. Uh, as uh, Dean mentioned that I was uh, studying in Soviet Union. When I was studying in Soviet Union, when, when I came first time, in the streets I bought first time ice cream in Soviet Union. During that time, there was no ice cream in Mongolia. And wh when I ate that ice cream, I thought how I can bring that ice cream to my mom, to my parents, you know, that, that was very delicious ice cream. But it was impossible. But you know, but when I came back, of course I shared my knowledge with my people. But from Kennedy School, I decided to share my knowledge with Mongolian people. And I developed a lecture called, titled, To Move or Not to Move. You know, and, and there were the subtitles, you know, moving Mongolia forward and reinventing the government. I think those are very familiar. Just us, you know. And I gave those lectures in, in a capital city, in the universities in Mongolia, in the provinces in Mongolia. That became great movement for change. And after that, in 2004, we had an election in Mongolia, and none of the political parties got majority. And I, I, during, during, in the midst of the political uh, campaign election, I was lecturing in Mongolia. And I came back, and because of that, you know, no party got the majority. Because of that, they decided to put Grand Coalition government. And they offered me prime minister seat, and I agreed. I agreed that, and I became prime minister second time in, in Mongolia. Uh, first time I became prime minister when I was there, 35 years old. Why I came to Kennedy School, you know, while uh, in, a, in a dusty streets of Mongolia making a revolution for 10 years, I thought I have to refresh myself. I have to take shower, you know. And I, I, I sent some application to some famous schools, and one of them was Harvard Kennedy School, and actually Kennedy School accepted, and I got the admission letter saying that you have to take 10 months intensive English course in Colorado, and you have to give the TOEFL exam. If you are eligible, welcome to Kennedy School. And they offered full tuition, full tuition. That was great. And I accepted <laughs> after the taking the 10 months course, English course, and I accepted to the Kennedy School of Government. And I filled with that, and I went back. And after that, in 2004 election, as uh, I, I told you that when I became prime minister, there was, uh, there was issue when I came back before us 
there was the almost one party dominance. Mongolian former communist party dominated four years, and there was the widespread corruption. And I decided to clean up our house, and I developed the corruption, anti-corruption program that actually became the anti-corruption law, anti-corruption agency now in Mongolia. And I asked which agency is most corrupted agency in Mongolia, and they answered, number one was the customs department. And I fought against that. More than 20 high, you know, ranking people actually were the under investigation. And I fought, uh, then there were the corruption related the land in, in, in our capital city. And I worked for two years. And during that time also I introduced flat tax reform in Mongolia. We call it four tens. We had a very many levels of taxes and uh, not good. And I decided to make four tens. Corporate tax 10, personal income tax 10, value-added tax 10, social tax 10. And I made that. And we got those four tens in Mongolia. Because of that, our economy revived. And during that time, we got first time in Mongolia, we got surplus economy. But uh, fighting the corruption is not easy thing. You know, I think as a politician, you can make decision. You can, as a leader of a country, a prime minister, you can make decision related with economy or social decisions much easier than the fighting corruption. Corruption requires taking actions making very hard decisions. And because of that, I got majority against me in the parliament, and I survived two years as prime minister, and I was dismissed by, from my position after two years, and voted out. And, uh, and, and after that, I, I actually be, again became the leader of my party, campaigning for, for, for my country. And now I would like to come back again to my second part of my talk, which I, which, which I told that I, I would like to put my talks in a three parts. And second part is uh, what kind of transition we had uh, from communism to democracy, from communist economy to, to uh, free market economy. Since cold winter in November 1989, I actually involved in Mongolian dem democratic movement. After graduation in Soviet Union, I came to my capital city and work in an army newspaper. And with my like-minded people, I established first non-communist democratic movement in Mongolia. During that time, Soviet Union was intact. And you know, we have uh, two big neighbors, Soviet Union and now Russian Federation and Chinese Re uh, People's Republic of China. And between them making that big transition, making that revolution was quite difficult. And, but we made that. And uh, I would like to highlight two things. We made that transition without shattering single window, without dropping single blood. We did that in Mongolia. <laughs> also, we made the transition, political transition. That was not only politi uh, economic transition, that was also political transition. Many people thought that making dual transition, transition, political and economic transition, at the same time, is not possible in Asia but we actually broke that old stereotype. We show to the world it is possible in Asia, even in a poor country in Mongolia. You know, enjoying your freedom, enjoying your rights, it's universal. It's, uh, you, you, even you are poor, you can make difference. Even you are poor, you can, you, you can uh, have a right to choose. And I usually say that, you know, our people and herdsmen say that, you know, herding, now having my herd like a, my, my property, this is my right. Even you are president, you are, has, ha, have a, has a no right to confiscate my herd. That's my democracy. That's my freedom. Even how, uh, that, that doesn't matter how high your positions. If you are doing bad things for country, I would like to criticize you openly. That's my right. 
That's the freedom of expression. My old mother, 92 years old, you know, she prayed for the Buddha for every night. That's the, her freedom. That's the, her democracy. And we gave that right to our people. In the late of 1990, June 1990, we had a first multi-party election in Mongolia. Since then, we have uh, seven elections in Mongolia. Just last June, we had a parliamentary elections for parliament. Within one week, actually, we managed to transform, transform from one party power to the other, to, to other party, peacefully. We did it. And because of that, my country now named us uh, the democratic anchor in the East. And I saw that no authoritarian government, no military regime can stand against the people's will who determined to be free. I saw it. I think I believe that in every heart, God actually has planted the desire to live free. Sometimes that desire crushed by some force, and again, that desire will wake up. And I really believe that one day we will live, all live with, with the freedom. Because for that, now Mongolia is working for that. In 2009, I became the candidate for president. My slogan, my motto was very simple. You know, I served my country two times as prime minister. I want, I have a journey to finish. I have an agenda. To, to implement, you know. I, we have to clean up our country from the, from the corruption, from red tapes. Two times I tried to, to do that in, in my country, but behind of, of me, parliament did not support, and I was two times dismissed from prime minister. And if you, people of Mongolia, if you support me, if you are only behind me, if you choose me as a president, I will continue my job. And they actually choose me. And in June 2009, I became first president from Democrat camp in Mongolia. After we having the heads of states for 90 years from Communist Party. What I did, I would like to briefly mention. I, I usually say that my policy has a two pillars. One is our people, one is our nature. And in the front of people, of course, uh, I wanted to give more justice to, to our people. And we have a, from the policeman to the judge. We have a judiciary system that actually serves the power. And I would like to, I wanted to reverse that. Not the, not the serving the power, serving the people. And uh, through that, we, we are now changed almost 10 laws, and I introduced 16 laws to my parliament. And uh, I think in the coming year, we will finish with that legal reform. After that, through that legal reform, we will reform structurally our judiciary system, and after that, we will take care of the personnel. And I think we will have that rule of law in place in Mongolia in coming years. I think from that, everyone will benefit. From that, everyone will benefit. And usually people see that no one is about the law. No one is about the law. When they see, see that there is minister, there is former president actually under investigation, people get encouraged. Okay, our government, our president, our leaders are very serious with this disease. In June last year, this year, we, uh, we had a Secretary Clinton coming to Mongolia, and I told to Secretary Clinton one story. You know, in uh, in uh, in last three months in 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 the states, there was one one story about Mongolia was very widespread. That story was related with the dinosaur skeleton. A skeleton called dinosaur batar, which was uh, slipped away from Mongolia, smuggled from Mongolia, ended up somehow in the United States of America. And they, they were the prepared auction that uh, dinosaur skeleton here. And I wrote later and we stopped that. And now that dinosaur skeleton will coming back to Mongolia. And I said that dinosaur actually lived 70 million years ago. 
I said to the Secretary Clinton, now we got, you know, in these days, in these years, we got one dinosaur called corruption. And we have to save our freedom from that dinosaur. Let's be together, you know, fighting that, uh, that uh, enemy in our land. And actually, Secretary Clinton was very supportive my idea and our agenda. So other thing, of course, related with the participation, related to people's power. I think even we made the democratic revolution, still men in a high offices holding the power. And we need to transform that power to our people. We need to make that, you know, our people in place, our people living in a small towns, in small provinces, they have to make decision how high should we tax, how much, uh, how, how can they elect their people, you know, they should have that power and we should give that power to our people and because of that I'm working with the Swiss government to make Mongolia from the representative democracy to direct democracy, to participatory democracy. If you are building civil society, if your citizens are having no right except, you know, choosing, except participating in the elections, if they do not have any voice, I think how you can benefit from that? I think people should have that right. And because of that, I am doing that. I hope Mongolia in our region will be having that uh, wide participatory democracy and further we will go to the direct democracy. Second issue, of course, uh, related with the environment, license. When I became the president, 46% of our territory was under exploration license, licenses. 46, almost half of my country. That's the size of Alaska we have. It. 1.5 million square kilometer land. And half of them were the exploration license. And I put moratorium in, and, and, and I, I introduced law stopping that. And now that actually reduced it to 15% from 46 to 15%. And also in the environment front, now we have an ambitious goal to make one third of our territory uh, under the protection of preserved territory for our next generation. We have a big territory. We need to preserve that pristine nature, that territory to our next generation. But now we got, as Dean mentioned, that fastest growing economy in the world, 17 and half percent, you know. That's the quite high growth even President Obama hap happily settled in. You know, we, we would like to share that growth with, with, with others. And now Mongolia is the, uh, chairing the community of democracies. 23 years ago, Mongolia had the same political economic system like today have Cuba or North Korea. After 23 years, now Mongolia is the leader of the democratic movement worldwide. And we are chairing the community of democracy and we will give that championship to Ecuador. Uh, Jamil, to the president, former president, is sitting here. I, I, when, when I studied here as a student, you know, I, I tried to hide my title as a former prime minister. I didn't say to anyone. I tried to be very law for filed. I had a little bit shame, you know, prime minister is studying here with us, you know, that's not good. I thought that, you know. But when I found out uh, uh, President Ecuador, Jamil is studying in my class, you know, <laughs> classmate, wow, I got encouraged. You know, studying is the lifetime journey. You can study for your lifetime, you know. Even you are 60 years old, 50 years old, you can come to Kennedy School and from here you can benefit. I think that's, uh, that, that's really good thing of Kennedy School. And I think Kennedy School and Harvard is really good brand. And I wanted, when after my graduation, I want to use that brand. If you are studied here, I think you have to use that brand. You have to sell that to your community. You know, you have to show you studied in a number one high learning institution in the world. And you have to be number one in your community, in your, in your, in, in your country. 
I think uh, you, you have to have that courage, and bec because of that, um, that actually gave me to tackle most uh, difficult challenges. For example, Mongolia was with the death penalty issue. Mongolia had a record, one of the three worst country, worst case country uh, related with the death penalty, North Korea, Belarus, Mongolia. And I, when, when I became the pr uh, president, I got two papers on my table. One is to execute, one is no execution. And I thought, I saw through that paper and I made that decision, no execution, pardoning, pardoning, pardon that, and, and I made pardon. And since June 2009, in Mongolia, we didn't have any, we, we did not have single execution. And we introduced uh, also protocol on death penalty, UN protocol, and I introduced draft of law to bring all those clauses related with the death penalty. I think that's, that was one of the issues. You, can, you, can you cannot have support from people. Usually people tend to say for death penalty. But the, that is one of the issues you can exercise your leadership. If your government is by the people, for the people, why your government is going to kill the people? That's not good. That's not good. You know, sanctity of life, human dignity is the most important thing. If you would like to establish justice system in your country, you have to begin from that. You have to begin from that. In some countries, I see that they uh, use that tool of the political repression, you know. They use, use that, uh, make some political opponents disappear. That's not good. I actually began from that. And we have a small population. And those, those were the really tough decisions to, to, to make in, 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 in my country. And uh, now I, I think I have, to, uh, I have to open for the question and answer. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> So we now have time for questions, and uh, for those of you that are new to the forum, I want to explain what a good question at the Kennedy School involves. Uh, first of all, uh, you, ad you identify yourself. Second, it is short and contains just one thought. Um, third, it ends with a question mark. Um, and with that, there are microphones here, here, here and here. So the, if you line up, uh, and I'll just go in order, so don't, don't find yourself in line where there's, uh, and there's again space. So we'll take as many as we can. Um, so let me go ahead and we will start um, right here. Great. Um, my name is Oyanga Bol and I'm from Mongolia. I'm the third year graduate, I'm a third year graduate student at Earth and Planetary Science Department here at Harvard University. And it's my great honor to be here and listen to our great leader. And um, I just had a Quick question, and um, how do you see the future of Mongolia? You know, I believe in the future of Mongolia because our country is not governed by the political parties or the politicians. Our country is governed by our people. And our people are smart. And they usually make good decisions. They usually correct bad decisions of government. I really believe in the power of openness. I really believe in the power of freedom. When free people, when you got the freedom, free people usually create wonderful things. Free people usually take their steps very responsibly. From that comes actually accountability. Uh, they ask very tough questions from government. When people free, they usually tend to create. That actually brings your country to prosperity. Because of that, Mongolia is a free country. Mongolia is a governed by people's choice. I really believe in a bright future of Mongolia. Thank you. Right up here. Yes. Uh, Mr. President, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Simon Lee, and I'm an uh, MPA student here. Uh, my question is regarding uh, the nuclear facilities in Iran. Uh, my question is, uh, what, in your opinion, uh, do you think is necessary to achieve 
a higher level of cooperation and openness uh, from Iran. Yeah. You know, one clarification. In last month, I attended non-aligned uh, summit in Iran, and I visited Islamic Republic of Iran. And uh, when in, in my hotel, in the English newspaper, I saw there is article, you know, if you would like, if the head of the state, head of the delegation want to go to nuclear facility in Iran, you are free, you, you can go there. And I thought, why I should not use that opportunity to go there? And on this issue, my standing is very clear. First, Iran, Iran should not endanger, Iran's nuclear activity should not endanger the, uh, any independent country's security. Iran should comply fully, fully with the UN, UN Security Council's resolution. And that is, that is my standing. And after visiting that, many people asked such a question. And I said also, I am not the weapons inspector. I am telling you what I saw. They invited me and, 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 and I was there. Other thing, Mongolia is, is that 20 years ago, Mongolia announced nuclear weapon free zone status. That actually supported by several resolutions of United Nations. That status not only, you know, ser serving in our region, that should serve in a worldwide. Other thing, why I had a visit to Iran, I think one of the interesting things was history. In the 13th, 14th century, Mongolians actually ruled for century, for one century. Our kings ruled P Persia. And also 200 century, we were there. And the many of the archives, many of the history, many of the heritages of the Genghis Khan, of his grandsons, of his uh, other, other kings there and in the archives of Iran. And we were actually looking for that historical heritage in Iran. We wanted to put that build, that bridge between our two countries. You know, we have a great study in Asia, in Europe about our past, but we do not, we almost do not have any study in that part of the world that actually opening for the science, for the exchange of our uh, researchers in that field. That was the main aim of visiting that country. Yeah. Thank you. Right up here. Hi, Mr. President. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is John Solo. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, and I wanted to ask you a question on behalf of the forum committee. Um, your story involves a lot of setbacks, a lot of moments of defeat. How did you maintain your perseverance? And how did you find in yourself the strength to make that comeback? That's really easy, you know. I usually, usually politicians, I say public servants, there is no such thing. Good, uh, good choice, bad choice. Usually there are bad choices. <laughs> Both of them very bad. You know, fighting corruption, bad as prime minister, one day you will be dismissed from your position. But fighting corruption is good for Mongolia. I usually think is about that. What is it good for Mongolia? What is good for Mongolian future? And I choose that. And I usually come back to my positions again. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's my secret. How I survive. In right down over here. Uh, hi, Mr. President. Uh, my name is Sita Gofard. I'm a sophomore at the college, and it's such an honor and privilege to be able to hear you talk. Um, I am very curious about particularly why Mongolia and why your leadership uh, have been so successful in making the transition to democracy in only 23 years. Um, you know, under your leadership, you've uh, accomplished many things in terms of uh, civil liberties, in terms of political freedoms. Um, a, a functioning democracy and um, rooting out corruption in government. Uh, but this is a problem that many, many countries around the world, um, in Asia and also elsewhere, struggle with. Um, and yet you managed to do it in only 23 years um, and is a model for the rest of the world. So I'm wondering um, what words of wisdom do you have for other nations out there that seek to emulate the success of your government in this aspect? Um, and what lessons can we draw away from Mongolia? 
You know, Mongolian success belongs to Mongolia, means that Mongolian success is owned by Mongolian people. Our democracy, our freedom is not foreign transplant. That's the, our wealth for which we fought together, for which we suffered together. And we owned our success and we owned our failure. I think uh, one of the beauty of the free nation, free, free, free system is you can make mistakes. Even president, even prime minister, you can make many mistakes, but you can fix that. You can learn from your mistakes. But in a closed society, that mistake can be your last mistake. But in an open society, from that you can learn lessons and advance. I usually say that, you know, democracy is a learning process. That's it, learning process. You usually go through very hard challenges, and if you make mistake, that's also sometimes good. And you learn that and you advance. That actually makes, uh, actually take your country, take yourself, and take your community to the progress. Yeah. Okay. Own, own your, yeah. Thank Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. Um, my name is Tiffany Lazo. I am a um, freshman in the college and I'm from Puerto Rico. Um, my question was, since Mongolia is growing at such a rapid pace, what measures or what policies are you planning to implement in Mongolia in order to maintain and sustain this economic development in a way that will continue to benefit the people of Mongolia and not so much bring in foreign in investments and make sure that it is something that is truly from the people and protect the culture? That's one of the challenges we are facing now. Mongolia is the one of the 10th richest country by mineral resources in the world. But you know, when, when you have that resource and you are facing that curse, your resource is going to become, you know, curse or blessing. I think uh, there is one great tool now we have in the world. World is becoming more flat. World has a, that tool, you know, internet. In order to be successful country, you know, exploring and exploit, uh, you know, making, uh, taking your resources, and you do not have to go to Harvard Library. Just sit behind in front of your computer, type what you into, what is your interest, and there will be plenty of literature, plenty of things will appear in front of you. You can learn from that. You know, there are many countries failed with the mineral resources, but a few countries actually succeeded. And there is one tendency, what kind of countries are succeeding? I saw one tendency, that's the open countries actually succeeding. After this visit, I will go to Norway. Norway is one of the example that success. That's open country, how they use that mineral wealth, that oil wealth for their country, for their people. And you know, Canada is open country, Australia is open country, and Mongolia is open country. One of the beauty of the open country, people has a chance to fix, people has a chance to, you know, reverse that bad decisions of their governments. People has a right to influence. Because of that, I think we will take that route. And there are great many expertise, and we will learn from that. Right up here. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it, it is a privilege to, to speak to you. My name is Akola Wet, and I'm an, an MPA student here at Kennedy School, and I'm from South Sudan. Uh, we are sometimes told that corruption is everywhere, that it is something that never goes away. It is always going to be there in a society by some leaders. And from your lecture today, it turns out that actually good leadership could actually combat corruption. If you are a good leader, you can actually fight corruption. How do you, how do you speak to your colleagues out there who aren't coming up to speed to fight corruption, who actually tell their people that it is something that never goes away and I'm not going to do something about it. How do you tell them that it is actually doable? I think most essential thing to fight corruption, I think you, you have to put in place independent judiciary system. 
you have to reform that system. In order to reform that system, you have to get along with your lawmakers, with your parliament, or with your decision makers. In order to make that, before that, you have to educate your people. I think if you are no president, you are no prime minister, you can be great speaker, lecturer, you know, go out from your capital city, go from your comfort zone, and go to the people and speak from your heart. You know, how we can get rid of that, and that issue, you know? If you educate your people, usually people, get, people, people suffer from that corruption. If, if someone paid on customs, you know, bribery, they usually include to that uh, payment, to the price of the goods and they sell to your mother, to my mother, to your father. And everyone pays the price of the corruption. One disease that eats away everything that everyone pays. And you have to make people to understand that. I think education, education. Once your society educated with that, usually politicians tend to, tend to follow the people's mood, mood you know? Uh, that politicians, such kind of animal, you know, what, what kind of messages are people are supporting? Are they against corruption or they are for it? If they are became the whole society, 70% of, of your society became aware that disease in your country, you have a chance to succeed. You have a chance to succeed. If you go there, never compromise. I think justice is non-negotiable. Justice is non-negotiable. And, and you have to tell, that's really hard, you know, you will punish your friend, your one party, your closed ally, your, you know, brother or someone will be under that. But you never go back. You have to stand. To become good politician, I think you have to have that value. You have to have that courage and execute that policy with the, with the, with, with the support of your people and you will succeed. I think one day, one day, many countries will be rid of the corruption. And the corruption is usually related with the, with the decision makers. Corruption is usually related with, the, with, with those people in a power. Corruption is not issue related with the people, you know, ordinary people. Corruption, that's the issue related with that power. That's the small segment of your society. If you got that support, you will you you will feel you will feel that that comfort and also you know last year with the president obama we launched open government initiative that's really great initiative and there is law and we're going to introduce law if you are people make decision related with the money every day on website your decision should be transparent, open. Anyone can go there, how much our governor spend money, for what purpose, how my governor's uh, wife went to the capital city, by public money or by his private money. I think if you have everyday expenditure, everyday uh, coming uh, money and going out, uh, anyone looking for that, people usually interest, not the, you, what, what, what your boss is doing, people usually is interest how they are spending the money and make them, make them open to the people by law. If they don't do that, you fire them. You fire them. That's the, that, that, that gonna be, I think, that, that will make also big changes in my country. I think, please support that. If you go open government, uh, something like that on, on Google, you will find that initiative. But you will be also see the photo, which is the clothes on my face, President Obama's palm. When, <laughs> that, that photo, you may remember, you know, last year, that was the President Obama, we were to take a photo of all the leaders of that heads of uh, uh, states, and uh, President Obama actually waved, but I stood here, and he's <laughs> like this, and many people, wow, why you are standing behind of the President <laughs> Obama's hand, you know, everyone is asking, that photo was the one of the interesting photo of the year, you know, <laughs> that ranked number seven, <laughs> that behind of that <laughs> President Obama's hand, that my face was, I, I told my people, you know, President Obama's hand can cover my face, but his hand not going to cover my country. You know, my country bigger than his hand. <laughs> and actually, <laughs> from that, many people got comfort. <laughs>
That was the initiative. Okay. Right up here. Thank you so much for your remarks. I'm Elsa, and I'm a sophomore at the college. And going off of that photo, I was hoping you could talk a bit more about how you see Mongolia's place in the world in terms of relations with the U.S., relations with China, and participation in the non-aligned movement. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You know, many people wonder how a small Mongolia is surviving between two giant countries. You know, we are neighboring the Russian Federation. It's the biggest land country in the world and the most populous country, People's Republic of China. I usually say that, you know, we used to, you know, live next to each other for centuries. We have established mechanism between our governments and we respect each other. You know, Chinese leaders respect our people's choice, our government decision, and we respect theirs. Russian people respect our people's choice. Russian government respect our, our government's decision, and we have that high-level meeting. Only I'm a president for three years. I, I had a meet with the President Putin and Medvedev seven times, with the Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping, maybe also seven times. You know, we have every time that high-level exchanges. In every level, we have that kind of mechanism. And because of that, I think we are benefiting from that. Now China is the most important market in the world. Mongolia is sharing longest land border with China, 4,700 kilometer border. You know, we have uh, that mineral resources in Mongolia, which is needed in China. Why Mongolia is becoming a much attractive place in the world? Because of that market. And if we cooperate together, mutually win-win cooperation, I think our people will benefit. Also with Russia and with the America. Also we have, uh, I usually say that to the American leaders, you know, we have a common value. Human rights, rule of law, openness, justice, you know, that's the, our common value. And we dream for that together, and we fight for that together. Our men and women in a uniform actually served together in Iraq. Now they are serving together in Afghanistan in a, many hot places, also in South Sudan, that the student asked. And you know, Mongolia is the, one of the active contributing country for the peacekeepers, and Mongolians proud to serve in a peacekeeping capabilities. And there was no one actually questioned why you are sending as a president our daughters and you know boys to the harm's way. Our people never questioned that, but we respect that service. Even a small country can be a big example, you know? Big example, shining example for doing good things for others. Okay, uh, this I'm afraid will have to be the last question right here. Wow. No pressure, huh? Um, Mr. President, thank you so much for being here. My name is James Gutierrez. I am a um, joint degree student between the Kennedy School and MIT Sloan and MBP MBA. Um, I'm really excited to hear your enthusiasm for your, your time here at the Kennedy School and um, that you enjoyed your time as I have my time here. Um, and you alluded to some lessons that you learned here at the Kennedy School. And I was wondering if you could close by uh, speaking specifically. What were some of your best lessons during your time here? And, um, and maybe we can use those in the future. You know, yeah, those classes related with the leadership, those classes related with the negotiation, art of communication, I think those were the most vivid class, classes for me. And after, I think if every student make that, I think that will be the sharing the Harvard wealth with the world, you know, if every student coming back to their countries, giving the lecture, what you learned at the Harvard in your communities, I think that will be a great thing, great thing to do. I did that. I benefited from that. You know, Harvard is the great brand, great brand. I, I told you, if you are here, now you are relax. But you have to fuel yourself, you know. You have to go run shopping, you know. Shopping means usually in, a, in, a, in a, every, every, every school year starting, we, we, we shopping the classes and which class I took, which class I go dismiss and, you know, make that shopping and try to go to get within one year, within three years, as much as fuel you can take. And I'm still with that fuel, you know. I did not refuel. I have that, <laughs> that Harvard fuel with me. Because of that, 
I'm, 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 I'm doing. And of course, I think uh, every student here uh, has a choice to succeed. And uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm just trying to, trying to share with my people, with my children, you know, uh, children, when, when they fight over balls, when they fight over meals, you know, usually kids do that. And I, I try to make them cooperate. I try to make them negotiate with them. I try to share my lessons. That's it. That's, that's way how I deal with the problem. And I think, uh, you know, being politician, being public servant is not a difficult thing. I usually say that, you know, uh, I, I usually remember that one, 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 one lesson from the JFK and ask what you can do. That's, that's really, really good thing. In Mongolia, we have a great, great saying. Take, first, take care of yourself. I think first you have to change yourself. And after that, you take care of your community. Third, you take care of your state. I think taking care of your state is, if you are not taking care of yourself first, if you are not taking care of your family second, you cannot take care of others. First of all, you have to take care of yourself. Our great king, Genghis Khan, even said that. He said that, you know, it was easy to conquer the world on the horseback. What was challenging to dismount and try to govern. That was said 800 years ago, and that's the truth today. And also, I would like to close my remarks here. Uh, one, one saying from, from Mother Teresa. She said, God does not require that we succeed. God only asks that we serve. You know, God is asking to serve. As a public servant, I usually say to my people, if you are becoming the public servant, this is equal to saying that, you know, give me your problem. Take my happiness, my people. You know, I came to solve a problem. I'm not came to become the problem. I came to for the solution. I'm the solution for your problem, for your challenges. If you don't do that, if you, you know, take some cash into your pocket, if you would like to become rich while you are serving in the public, while you are in the politicians, you are in the wrong place, you are in the wrong planet, you know, you have to go away from the public service. You can be a good herdsman, okay, go there. You know, you can be a good businessman. And I think you have to understand that essence of the service essence of the service is sharing that pain, that challenges. If you have that passion, I think people will understand. And good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, and thank you for getting off your horse and governing. It's a great, great honor having you here. Thank you very much. Have a safe evening, everyone.